This is the second part of my step one pulmonology review, and in this video I will be going over various respiratory pathologies and common ways that you are going to be tested on your step one exam. The following audio was recorded in a classroom setting, so I apologize for any decrease in quality or background noise. I'm just going to be rapid fire. This is going to be interactive, but I'm just going to do it by myself here. So what's the location that your maxillary sinus is drained to? Is it the superior meatus, middle meatus, or inferior meatus? The answer is the middle nasal meatus. That's important because blockage of this causes rhinosinusitis. Epistaxis is the next thing that first aid goes through. Two main things you need to know about this is that you can have an anterior bleeding source or you can have a posterior bleeding source, and they want you to know what vessels are causing the bleeding. Uh, they ask this very commonly, actually. So if it's anterior bleeding, this is coming from Kieselbach's plexus. And if it's posterior bleeding, this is from the sphenopalatine artery, which is a branch of the internal carotid artery. And this is a life-threatening bleed. So if you have somebody who's coming in with epistaxis, and they're like bleeding, and they're unstable, and they're just like hemorrhaging out through their nose, you should be more concerned of a sphenopalatine artery bleeding source. OK, a uh, smoker now has ulcer in their throat, or their neck, or their tongue, or their mouth. It's always squamous cell carcinoma. They ask this question every single day. And they're going to try and trick you and make you think it's not squamous cell carcinoma, but it's always squamous cell carcinoma, so just pick squamous cell carcinoma. Pregnant patient with difficult labor now has shortness of breath and DIC. That is an amniotic fluid embolism. They had a difficult labor. All of a sudden, some amniotic fluid gets in their blood, goes up to their lungs. Now they're having shortness of breath and DIC. Patient who broke their hip several days ago now has shortness of breath, confusion, and a petechial rash. Okay, they always ask this question, and the answer is always fat embolism syndrome. Anytime anybody comes in with a broken hip, broken femur, they got in a car accident, okay, it's fat embolism, until proven otherwise. And not only that, but they try and trick you, okay? They, they trick you by saying, okay, this person comes in, but they don't have a petechial rash, and we did a CT scan, and there's no filling defects. It doesn't matter. Any patient that comes in with a broken hip, it's always fat embolism. I've gotten tricked and just put fat embolism, okay? PFT findings in a patient with obstructive lung disease. This is a review of what we went over earlier, okay? What are the PFT findings? The main one is, remember, it's that decreased FEV1 over FVC ratio. And everything else is going to be increased, okay? Functional residual capacity, increased. Residual volume, increased. Tender love and care, increased, okay? PFT findings in patient with restrictive lung disease. This one's also pretty easy. Once you know it, everything is decreased, and they have a normal FEV1 over FEC. Make sure you can identify those within five seconds of getting a question on your step one exam. Patient with COPD has been coughing up tons of crap for three, greater than three months in a year, for two plus years. That is the, diagno the diagnosis of chronic bronchitis. So COPD patient coughing lots of crap up for this time frame, that's chronic bronchitis. Um, you have this thing called the Reed Index. So the, the reason they're coughing up all this crap is because they have hypertrophy of their mucus secreting glands. Now if you look at the thickness of this gland layer to the, the thickness of the wall uh, overall, that's called the Reed Index, and that can tell you the severity of somebody's chronic bronchitis. Now, what if you have a patient with COPD, they have shortness of breath, and they have upper lung blebs from loss of elastase. So they might show you an x-ray, and there's all these like little bubbles of air in their upper lung fields. That is emphysema. Now, what if you have a kid with emphysema? Okay, this, there's a kid with shortness of breath. They have lower lung blebs, blebs instead of upper lung blebs. Oh, also, by the way, they happen to have liver disease. Okay, that's alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Because a kid should not have emphysema, even if they were smoking. Uh, it takes time to develop emphysema. If there's a kid with emphysema and they have liver disease, it's alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Don't smoke, because if they smoke, they're going to develop lung disease way, way earlier than even a normal person who was a chronic smoker. Patient has shortness of breath and wheezing after popping an aspirin. OK, 
Okay, pretty simple. That's aspirin-induced asthma. You should know that aspirin can induce asthma. The reason for that is because COX inhibition causes overproduction of leukotrienes, which leads to airway constriction. Okay, patient has shortness of breath and wheezing, and they have these findings in their sputum. Oh my gosh, what are these? These look like little spirals. These are called, what? These are called the Cushman spiral. Okay, and these are little, little broad rods called crystals. They're crystals, they're called Charcot-laden crystals. These are two findings of asthma. If you see this on your step one exam, you should know that they are trying to get you to answer a person having asthma. Respiratory pathology, more respiratory pathology. Patient is having a super bad asthma flare, and now their heart sounds, when you're taking their blood pressure, they disappear on inspiration. So you hear it, and they're taking a breath in, and now you no longer hear anything. Oh my gosh, what is that? What is that called? That is called pulsus paradoxus. That is something you're gonna rarely see, but it could, you could see in somebody with really, really bad asthma. And the reason that happens is because there's so much pressure in their lungs that when they take a deep breath in, there's just so much resistance in their right heart and they lose their blood pressure uh, sounds on inspiration. What is the reason a patient with a super bad asthma flare may suddenly stop wheezing? Okay, this patient looks super sick and they're wheezing and then you go reevaluate them and they're, they still look super sick but they're not wheezing anymore. Okay, the answer to that is they're, they're getting even worse. They're having even more respiratory failure and they're not even making enough airflow to have wheezing sounds anymore. So just because somebody stops wheezing, if they still look bad, you need to be concerned that they're getting worse, basically. This is such a common question. That's why I have another question of a patient with a super bad asthma flare. And their partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 30. Remember, a normal is 40. So they're really tachypnic, so they're blowing off a lot of carbon dioxide. It's 30, and now you go back and reevaluate them 30 minutes later, and it's 40. Oh, wow, that's a good thing, right? It's their partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going towards normal. No, that's wrong. They are having impending respiratory failure. Basically, they're getting so sick that they can't even blow off the carbon dioxide anymore. So now that it's normal, that's actually falsely elevated at this point, and it's a sign of respiratory failure. So just because you see somebody's carbon dioxide go towards normal, if it, they're having a super bad asthma flare, you need to be concerned that they're having impending respiratory failure and need intubation. Patient with recurrent infections. Okay, they got sick two weeks ago, and then they got sick, they actually were sick one month ago, and then they were sick one year ago, and half a year ago, and now they have permanently dilated airways. That's a description of bronchiectasis. What are some risk factors for bronchiectasis? It's associated with smoking. It's associated with Cartagenar, Cartagenar syndrome, also known as primary ciliary dyskinesia, and cystic fibrosis. It's also associated with tuberculosis, but that's super rare. So what is the defect in Cartagenar, Cartagenar syndrome? That is gonna be a defect in your dynein arm in your cilia. So your cilia are all dysfunctional because the dynein arm is broken. What is the defect in the CFTR channel in cystic fibrosis? Okay, they, they ask this question all the time, and people always put, oh, it's some abnormality in the ion conduction, or the electrolytes are not, you know, transferred through the CFTR channel. But the answer is always protein structure and trafficking. Okay, there's five different types of cystic fibrosis mutation. And everybody picks this one, decreased CFTR channel conduction of ion. But that is not the most common cause of cystic fibrosis. That is, that answer to the most common cause is class two, which is impaired CFTR channel processing and traffic. Basically, the protein for this channel gets all misfolded, it's all crazy, gets out of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and it doesn't traffic well to the membrane, the cell membrane where it's supposed to go. It kind of just like swims around in your cytoplasm and it doesn't traffic well. Um, so that's the most common defect for cystic fibrosis. What if a patient has recurrent lung infections and they have absence of vas deferens? What is that referring to? Oh, that's referring to cystic fibrosis. Recurrent lung inf infections and their heart is on the right side of the body rather than the left side. Interesting. Hmm, what could cause that? Okay, that's Cartagenar syndrome, aka primary ciliary dyskinesia. I found this 
very helpful because I kept getting these mixed up. Make sure you don't get these mixed up. Don't think that the absence of vas deferens is Cartagenar syndrome. Don't think that dextrocardia is cystic fibrosis. Make sure you get these clear in your brain ball. Respiratory pathology. Farmer has shortness of breath, cough, headache, every time he goes to work. But when he goes home for the weekend, it gets better. That's describing hypersensitivity pneumonitis, okay? This is a type three or type four hypersensitivity reaction. It's not type one. It's not allergic. It's a delayed and immune complex mediated. Patient with shortness of breath and cough tells you that they own a bunch of exotic parrots. Well, that's the same thing. It's hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Don't own a bunch of parrots. Don't go home. You, they, you need to tell the patient they need to sell their parrots. Patient with shortness of breath has hyalur lymphadenopathy and a calcium of 10.4. It's always sarcoidosis. Anybody with hypercalcemia, anybody with shortness of breath and hyalur lymphadenopathy basically has sarcoidosis, unless it's tuberculosis, but then it'll be a little bit more obvious. But shortness of breath, hyalur lymphadenopathy, calcium of 10.4, sarcoidosis. Why is the above patient's calcium elevated? The reason for that is because they have elevated 1-alpha hydroxylase, which basically activates their vitamin D, and they get calcium of 10.4. What is the treatment for sarcoidosis? Give them those steroids. Okay, one more thing I want to mention. On your step one exam, sarcoidosis patients are not always young African-American female. I went into, because they always teach it like that, I went into the exam thinking, hey, if it's not a young African-American female, they're probably trying to get to something other than sarcoidosis, but that's wrong. Even if it's a, a Caucasian male who's 50, if they have shortness of breath and hyaluronic lymphadenopathy with hypercalcemia or any of the other signs of sarcoidosis, like elevated CD4, CD8 ratio, they have these eye symptoms, uveitis, they have erythema nodosum, if, even if they're not a young African-American female, it's still sarcoidosis, okay? This is showing, showing the non caseating granulomas of uh, biopsy of sarcoidosis. They may show you this on your test. And this is showing you some hyalur lymphadenopathy. Look how large these uh, lymph nodes are. They're just super big. Respiratory pathology continued. Does asbestosis affect the upper or lower lungs? It affects, hmm, okay, it affects the lower lungs. Barriet viriliosis affects the upper lungs. Does co-workers pneumoconiosis affect upper or lower lungs? It's the upper lungs. How do you remember this? So there's a good mnemonic in first aid. Asbestos, asbestos is from the roof, but affects the base, which is your lower lobes. Silica and coal are from the base, from earth, but they affect the roof. You should know this because they're gonna ask you a question and they're gonna tell you that the patient has pathology in their lower lungs. That makes you automatically realize, okay, this is probably asbestosis. Describe the sputum finding of asbestosis. They're obsessed with this also, okay? You've got these ferruginous bodies. And I don't know why they're so obsessed with this description, but they are, so just know it. It's golden brown dumbbells, which stain with Prussian blue. Okay, here's a picture here. They kind of look like dumbbells, I guess, um, and they stain with Prussian blue. They're gonna ask you a question on this, probably, for some reason, they're just obsessed with this. Um, asbestosis is more likely to cause what kind of cancer? Lung cancer, mesothelioma. Make sure you know that lung cancer is way, way, way more common than causing mesothelioma. Mesothelioma is the cancer of your pleura, basically. Um, and asbestosis is associated with that. And it's really unique in the fact that it does that. But it's so much more common to cause lung cancer rather than mesothelioma. What if you have somebody who's a coworker and has pneumoconiosis, and now they have swelling in their joints? That is Kaplan syndrome, okay? That's a syndrome that can happen. Uh, this, tri this kind of constellation of findings is an actual thing that can happen, and it's called Kaplan syndrome. Patient with pneumonia progresses to sepsis, so they're getting worse. And now you take an x-ray, and they have diffuse bilateral lung opacities. That, my friends, is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Okay, how about this? There's a patient with an abnormal chest x-ray, and they're in respiratory failure. They're very sick. But you get a blood gas, and their partial pressure of oxygen is 100. Normal is 80 to 100, so they're on the high side of normal. And they're on 40% oxygen. 
is this ARDS? Well, yes, this is ARDS. Okay, these are the diagnostic criteria for ARDS. Abnormal chest x-ray, respiratory failure within one week of alveolar insult, decreased PaO2 over FiO2 ratio less than 300. Okay, I looked at that and I had no idea what that was talking about for the longest time, but once you just do it, it's easy. So PaO2 over FiO2 ratio. This patient above had PaO2 of 100, so that goes up here. FiO2 is the fraction of inspired oxygen, so he was on 40% oxygen, so you do 0.4, and their PaO2 of FiO2 ratio is 250, which is less than 300, which meets the criteria for ARDS. So even, there, even though his partial pressure was 100, which seems really good, he was on 40% oxygen, and so he was still in ARDS because he required so much oxygen. So now you know how to calculate PaO over FiO2 ratio. The treatment is mechanical ventilation with low tidal volumes and high PEEP. Low tidal volumes is important. I don't know if they're going to test you on step one for that though, so, but in case you get a question, low tidal volume, high PEEP. A uh, fat person who snores at night, okay, obstructive sleep apnea. You should know this table pretty well. It's pretty simple. Um, basically, if you have air surrounding your lungs, or if you have emphysema, or you have COPD, the more air you have, when you tap and percuss it, it's going to be hyperresonant. If you have fluids surrounding your lungs, or you have pneumonia and it's consolidated, it's going to be dull. Everything decreases fremitus except for consolidation. Just review this table and make sure you know it, and make sure you understand why these findings are caused. Because if you actually sit there and think about it, you can figure out, you could just kind of logic through it. Um, and if you have questions about it, just send me a question. Um, what does this patient have? Um, this person, person, they might show you a picture of this on the exam. This person has a little bit of right-sided chest pain and a mild shortness of breath. They have a pneumothorax. Do you see this like line right here? That's their lung. That's a white visceral pleural line. There's an absence of lung vessel markings out in the periphery. That is a sign of ten, that's a sign of uh, a pneumothorax. So there's different types of pneumothorax. There's primary pneumothorax, which would be, okay, this person is just a, the, the most common person is a tall, thin male who could also be a smoker, is also a risk factor, suddenly has these sub-apical like, blebs in their lungs and they rupture and then they get a pneumothorax. That's a primary pneumothorax. Secondary pneumothorax means they had really bad COPD and, or emphysema and one of those blebs blebbed open and caused a pneumothorax, okay? That's secondary pneumothorax. And traumatic, so somebody was getting a central venous line up in their, above their clavicle, uh, and the apex of the lung is actually all the way up there, so a common way to get a traumatic pneumothorax is, okay, knife, knife stab into the rib, uh, that's traumatic pneumothorax. Or central venous catheterization uh, can also cause a traumatic pneumothorax. We need to be aware of a tension pneumothorax, which is shown here. You can see a mediastinal shift to this side, and it's just like a crazy big pneumothorax. It's going to cause hemodynamic instability. Um, when you have this constellation, this person's blood pressure is going to be 80 over 40 or something crazy like that. They're going to be in really big time distress. That's a tension pneumothorax. Um, and you should know that the, the most common reason for a tension pneumothorax is like a one-way wet valve, which means air can go in, but air cannot go out. So it just keeps building up. The pressure gets bigger and bigger, pushes the heart to the side. All of a sudden, they're hemodynamically unstable. More respiratory pathology. Patient with flu gets better but one week later now has fever and cough. That is a secondary bacterial pneumonia. Most common organism causing this? That would be Staph aureus. Remember your sketchy guys, remember your sketchy. Most common organism causing pneumonia in general, that's gonna be strep pneumo. Pneumonia plus diarrhea, that is Legionella. Pneumonia plus relative bradycardia. So normally when you have pneumonia, you get a fever and the fever causes an increase in your heart rate. So you're gonna be tachycardic, you're gonna be like over 100. What if you have pneumonia and your heart rate is like 65 or something? That's again going to be Legionella or atypical pneumonias, the walking pneumonias that don't really cause that much symptomatology in your peeps. Patient with lung cancer. And the question stem tells you this cancer is near the bronchi. What are they trying to get at with this? This is a huge thing to, to know because you're definitely going to be asked on central versus peripheral lung cancers, and they're not going to tell you it's central versus 
peripheral. They're just going to tell you, oh, it's near the bronchi, or oh, it's near the apex or something. If it's near the apex, that's in the periphery. If it's near the bronchi, that's central. Okay? So this, is, this question stem is trying to tell you that this is a central lung cancer, which there are two types. They both start with S, and S sounds like central. So small cell cancer and squamous cell carcinoma. I guarantee you, you're going to get a question on small cell cancer versus squamous cell. They love this. I don't know. They're obsessed with this. So now I have 10 million questions for you guys to answer. Patient has a cancer in their lung that's near the bronchi, and also they have easy bruising, central obesity, and stretch marks. What is that? Okay, that is going to be small cell lung cancer. And this is describing Cushing's because small cell causes a ton of perineoplastic syndromes, one of them being Cushing syndrome. Patient with central lung cancer has a sodium of 120. Is that central? Is that, uh, sorry, is that small cell or is that squamous cell? That is small cell. That's describing SIADH, which means they're going to be retaining too much water, which is going to dilute the sodium in their blood. So now their sodium is 120, which is really low because normal sodium is 135. Now they have small cell with SIADH, another perineoplastic syndrome. Patient with central lung cancer and a calcium of 14. This one's obvious, guys. This is squamous cell with hypercalcemia of malignancy. And that's because it's releasing the uh, PTH-related protein, which is the fake PTH uh, that's going to cause hypercalcemia. And let me tell you something. Anytime you see a calcium of 14, it's hypercalcemia of malignancy until proven otherwise. And on your board exams, if you see a calcium of 14, it's always hypercalcemia of malignancy. If you see a calcium of 10 or 10.5, it could be whatever. Remember when I showed you that sarcoidosis patient earlier with a calcium of 10.5? That was just like a non-malignant uh, non hypercalcemia. But if it's 14, they always have some kind of uh, tumor, okay? Patient with central lung cancer, and they have muscle weakness that improves with repetition. That is small cell with Lambert-Eaton myasthenia syndrome. I think that's supposed to be an E, not an A. lambert eaton myasthenia syndrome, another perineoplastic syndrome. Patient has central lung cancer, and they show you cavities. That's going to be squamous cell. Squamous cell lung cancer likes to cavitate. What's a histological finding of small cell cancer? What are you going to see when you take a biopsy? You're going to see small blue cells. You're also going to see chromogranin positive and neurosynaptophysin positive, all these like random things. Okay, histological finding of squamous cell cancer, keratin pearls, and intercellular bridges. Make sure you know these, like the back of your foot. Peripheral lung cancer and hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, aka clubbing, plus low smoking correlation. This is the most common lung cancer. This is adenocarcinoma of the lung. Uh, peripheral lung cancer, with highly min which is highly malignant and has pleomorphic giant cells. That is a large cell carcinoma. Neuroendocrine lung tumor, which can cause right-sided heart failure. That's going to be bronchial carcinoid tumor. Remember, if you have a regular uh, carcinoid tumor, which is going to be in your ileum of your small bowel, that is not going to cause right-sided heart failure because your liver is going to kind of uh, block all the serotonin and histamine from causing right-sided lung failure. But you're still going to have the flushing and the diarrhea and the bronchospasm. Okay, they're going to show you a picture of this. They have what looks to be a lung abscess with air fluid levels. What kind of organism would you expect to find in this febrile patient? It's going to be anaerobes. What if you have a tumor at the apex of the lung causing shoulder tingling and weakness? That is called what kind of tumor? That is a pancose tumor. What if you have a tumor at the apex of the lung and now you have swollen face and headaches? This is because you're compressing the SVC and drainage of venous circulation from your head is not occurring. So you get SVC syndrome. These are some random bonus questions that I added. Uh, what part of the airways contributes the most to total airway resistance? That would, the answer to that would be medium-sized bronchi. Where is resistance lowest on this lung volume graph? Okay, the answer would be at the end of expiration of tidal volume. That's when your lung resistance is the lowest. And then I have a bunch of questions uh, talking about COPD. So COPD, remember, you don't want to give them oxygen because you can cause respiratory failure because they lose their respiratory drive. Why do they lose their respiratory drive? Uh, it's because of stimulation of the carotid bodies, 
and uh, this causes reversal of the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and all of a sudden they're getting all this blood flow to places that aren't well ventilated and they can basically go into respiratory failure because you gave them oxygen. So be careful of getting too much oxygen to patients with COPD. Pharmacology is the last section. First aid details this pretty well. Just make sure you know the mechanisms of each of the drugs. Uh, NBME te frequently tests these with second order questions. So for example, uh, here is a simple asthma question. They said they treated this person's asthma with a single pharmacologic agent that rapidly improves his condition. Oh, okay, that's probably a beta agonist. Oh my gosh, these are all the answer choices. Activation of GI protein linked, GQ protein, GS protein, uh, IgE, blah, blah, blah. You need to know all of these really, really down and easily, and you can do that by reviewing the first aid uh, portion. Just know that you actually have to focus on it because it's high yield. All the medications they like to test uh, with these second order questions, all right? And I think that is it. So thanks for watching this pulmonology review. I hope it was helpful. Um, and good luck with dedicated study. Thanks, and see you guys. Uh, and let me know if you have any questions. Peace. <laughs>